Hello and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. We're David Waxman and Minnie Ingersoll, partners and investors at 10110. Welcome back to the podcast. Peter Goldberg is with us today. He is the managing partner at PLG Ventures, where he likes to invest really early, pre-product, pre-revenue sometimes, which is great for the ecosystem. Before PLG, he was a CEO at Amtrust, the largest privately held bank in the U.S., so I'm going to have to ask him how he became CEO of the largest privately held bank in the U.S. He's a frequent collaborator with us at 10110. He's a good friend of ours, and he is known for having the best VC holiday dance party. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you both. Hi, David. Hi, Minnie. Hi. Welcome. Great. So we like to cover the the basics of your fund and then get into the more exciting, you know, dance party type discussion. But let's cover the basics of, you know, what size checks. Sure. So we are a family office back venture firm, meaning we don't have any limited partners. This is my personal capital and my family office's capital. So it allows us to do things in many cases with more flexibility, more freedom, and we don't have the same fiduciary duty that other uh, fund managers have when you have limited partners. So we can get in and do things uh, sometimes at other, the more traditional funds can't. Uh, we have just under 50 companies in the portfolio. We'll write an initial check up to 250000 to start. Uh, we'll do follow-ons for the winners and uh, even the ones that sometimes need a little extra push and uh, jump start. Uh, but our largest position is a million. We have stuff at a half a million. So uh, at the end of the day, we have a nice little portfolio that we're very proud of. So when you have that flexibility, sometimes we'll look at things that we think are really hot companies and it's a hard to get into series A, series B, they're raising $10 million. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that because it doesn't work with our portfolio construction. Like, do you ever do, what are the sort of the wild things you do that you can't do if you've got LPs who are stricter? Well, I mean, th- there's a deal that I'm going to be literally funding at the end of this month. It is um, a $40 million pre raising $15 million and they had 14 and a half accounted for and they wanted to save some money for some celebrities. That's definitely not me. Not me. I don't know why. It's definitely not my good looks and my charming (laughs) personality. But they knew um, the people that were leading the deal that I could be very additive. This is way past what my typical check, um, you know, valuation and ownership, but I love what they're doing. And I think this has the potential of being a multi-billion dollar company. So I do have that flexibility to say, you know something? I'm going to put money in that deal. And, um, you know, I have to have discipline because then at some point it's like, well, I might as well just put money in the stocks and buy. I mean, it's where do you draw the line for investments? Um, I, I'm not going to be as hands on probably with a company like that. But yes, I have ultimate flexibility. I actually did a deal that was uh, the most expensive was 170 million pre. Do you have any sort of reporting requirement? Zero. So okay, so you don't you don't have to write quarterly letters or, or get to write quarterly letters and <laughs> put together financials. Zero. Yeah. Got it. So how do you keep yourself on on the rails? Well, I I'm gonna take back the zero. I don't have any formal reporting. Um some of my I have three sisters that are part of a family office that I'm the general partner of. So I do want to give them updates. Last night we had a company that was on Shark Tank and everybody was texting, this is one of the ones in the PLG portfolio. You better watch your company. Da, 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 da. So what holds me a little bit accountable is that when you have sisters, even though I have full authority to make the decision, you want to do the right thing. Uh, And because I'm always putting in as much, if not more money than um, that entity, you know, it still falls upon my shoulders. That's what keeps me uh, ground is because I am acting in some sort of fiduciary duty. It just happens to be my three lovely younger sisters. Got it. (laughs) And other things about the fund, the basics of, do you have an LA focus, consumer focus? You know, what are the things you, where's your focus? Yeah. So two thirds of our uh, portfolio are companies in the greater LA area. We have a couple in New York, a couple in San Francisco, a couple in Seattle, we have one in Chicago, Miami, so San Diego. So we have stuff located throughout the country. What we do that's a little bit different, and I would say I'm going to make it more dramatic, mostly different than most um, VCs, is we take a real um, strong focus on things that have to do with organizational behavior. I have an MBA in organizational behavior. I have another advanced degree in leadership development. I was the CEO, as you referenced earlier, of a large organization with thousands of employees and uh, measuring in billions of assets. And for us to be able to help with things like culture, 
leadership development, how can a leader be more reflective, uh, co-founder dynamics, board governance, things that are the foundation and infrastructure. A lot of VCs that haven't been a CEO, I mean, David obviously knows what it's like to run a company. They know this intellectually, but they have no clue on how to convey these types of things to a founder to help build that foundation, in my opinion, the best way. What could be more important for a startup that's early stage than helping them put the foundation and infrastructure in place to give them the highest probability for um, success and growth? So for me, that's what actually gives me passion. That's why I do it. The return, make no mistake, is important, but that's what I wanted to do in this chapter of my life. And and so when you're looking at companies to evaluate, are there leadership qualities that that maybe you're looking for that other VCs don't have a rigor around exploring? The answer is 100% yes. And it's the quality of connection. And what I mean by that is I believe that some of the greatest leaders have the ability to connect with other people, could be people on their team, employees, could be customers, it could be um, clients, whatever, to connect in a way that's genuine and real. And if you're able to do that, it creates this powerful bond that people can usually get the most. That's the one plus one equals three, you know, analogy that everybody hears about. When I'm doing um, an initial pitch or I'm with them, a lot of my questions have very little to do with the TAM and the CAC Mm -hmm. and your business strategy and the product. It's more about understanding the DNA of who they are and can I connect with them? And I have to feel it. I don't look for it. And and how do you differentiate that from just being a good salesperson? You have to feel it. it. It's a feeling. It's no different than if you're going on a date with somebody, if you're interviewing somebody. There's a feeling on how they make you feel. If somebody's a salesman, that doesn't usually... I know that. I, I It doesn't feel warm. and It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel genuine. Can you help people develop that quality of connection? We try. I mean, there's really, there's not a lot of things you can do. I mean, it is part of your personality and your DNA, but there's two very simple things that I think can dramatically enhance that occurring. One, in no particular order, would be, are they a reflective leader? Are they somebody that has insight into what impact they're having on others and what impact others are having on them. My father, love him dearly, is oblivious <clears throat> to what impact he has on me and my sisters. He acts a certain way. He doesn't know if I'm ready to jump out the window. It's, that's your dad mm-hmm. or your mom. I would not say he's a reflective person. Mm. He's the way he is. A leader that is reflective, okay, ultimately has the ability to have more information at their fingertips to make better decisions. They still might end up coming with the ultimate same decision, but now if they're aware of what they just did, what impact it had on somebody else or what impact it had on them, they usually can make a better decision. So that's self-awareness. The second thing, which sort of ties into it, talk less and just listen. And it's it's not rocket science. In order to be reflective, you have to keep your mouth shut. Okay, because if you're only hearing yourself talk, then at the end of the day, you're not really accomplishing anything. And so I just tell them a lot of times, I'll sit in an interview, watching them interview somebody, and they were doing all the talking. I'm like, you're not even listening to the person to see if it's the right fit or if it's with their co-founder, if it was a team meeting. So I would say just those two simple things. And are there practical, tactical things where you say, look, one of the things is you have to understand your impact on others. Do you sit down and say, like, here's how to run a 360 review process and get I, that feedback? Well, number one, I have done that, where we have facilitated 360 feedback reviews. And in this case, it was two co-founders. They were oblivious to what impact they were having onto their employees, as well as each other. Mm. They thought the one person was you know, evil and the other one was terrible. Well, they both had terrible marks. <laughs> And they were both with me in hysterical uh, tears because it was a very rude awakening. So things that have to do with 360 uh, feedback reviews, things that have, we have a third party company that does cultural assessment surveys that are anonymous um, surveys of 75 questions to just the staff. And then that's presented to the founders. So they get a real temperature on what the culture is within the organization. But yeah, so things like that can give people the insight. So I imagine writing 250K checks and and below, you're often not the lead investor. 
do you do you find yourself being the first check who goes and rounds up the round or a participant that joins after what's what's more common for you? in most cases i might be the first one to be with them and then i'll help them put the right team of we'll call it the syndicate of investors together um that's like the vast majority of the time um i've set prices i've set prices even with firms that are 50 times my size that have deferred to me to do it. Um, things that were bridge rounds a lot of times, I'm the one helping to do different things. I believe there is no doubt that the VCs, the investors, angels, family offices can all be additive. In reality, in a lot of cases, it's not that additive. It sounds good in theory. It's more about introductions and some emails and sometimes a pain in the neck. And it's, it's not the you know, rainbow and unicorn love affair that everybody thinks. So I'm not as enamored because, oh, this firm is in and that firm is in because a lot of firms are wrong too. Um, but if I know that this group is diversified, they have different skill sets, they have different things that they can be additive to, and there's enough money to get to what the next objective is, that's the number one thing I'm looking for. As long as the group is not counterproductive. Um, and that can happen. Yeah. That I don't take that much weight into jumping on the syndicate bandwagon because I think that's how you get in trouble. I actually don't, I don't think of you so much as a family office. I realize technically that is what you are, but uh, you, you seem to perform more of a roll up your sleeves approach that I associate more with a traditional venture fund. I appreciate that because that's the um, that's what we want to be known as. I mean, and that's why we use the term we're a family office back venture firm, not a venture fund, a venture firm. I want to act as we have internal reporting that I would say is as good, deal flow management. We have services to our portfolio companies for discounts, uh, job postings. Holiday that, parties. Holiday <laughs> parties that as much as any of the VCs, at least in town, do because I want to be, you know, holistically the total package. You lean most heavily in on this emotional intelligence, organizational foundation, whatever you just called it. Not true. Oh, darn. That's our secret sauce. Okay. But the reality is it sounds good in theory. Yeah. But everybody doesn't need a therapist every day or once a week. When it boils down to it, being a former banker, I've helped raise tens of millions of dollars. I help structure the deals. I, I'm making connections that's what a lot of this is still about. And and I don't want to diminish that. Um, I like to have pride that I can do something above and beyond that. But the reality is more of my time is spent on the more traditional things revolving around fundraising and problem solving right. than the organizational behavior, emotional intelligence type things. But when that works, it's more powerful than all those other things put together. You didn't grow up through uh, the HR piece of, you know, function. You grew up as a banker and yet you're focused on emotional intelligence. Like, how did you learn this? How did this become the thing that you, one of the things you wanted to call out? It's like, hang your hat on. I'm going to challenge you on that statement. Fine. In every organization, including banks, there's HR. I spent a tremendous amount of my career in HR at the bank. Oh. At a very early age, the um, head of HR actually began to work for me, and I set up a lot of the company policies, hiring, recruiting, retention strategies. Okay, okay. Give us the whole version. Give us so, your background. So, uh, give me but, some of this. So I don't want to give this impression of some white shirt buttoned down banker <laughs> carrying a briefcase. And also, as I, alluded, <laughs> as I alluded to earlier, I do have an MBA in organizational behavior. Yeah, but I have an MBA, and I, you know, I did not. And, <laughs> and. I have another advanced degree from a school outside of Paris called NCAD, and it was all about creating a reflective leader over the course of a year run by two psychoanalysts. So the reality is, while school doesn't teach you everything, a lot of my formal education is in the world of business and psychology. And when you're in a large organization, even when I was running the bank, a large percentage of my time was always revolving around people issues because that's what a comp that's the fabric of a company. It's the people. Tell us about your banking background because obviously I missed that you were working on the HR at the bank. Well, I started in the mailroom. Did you really? At age 13, 
My mom wanted me to go to overnight sleepaway camp. My dad says Peter's going to start working in the bank. This is your dad's bank. It was uh, my dad's side of the family. It was our family's uh, business. And one thing led to another. I went from the mailroom. I got one day promoted to the visa processing group uh, for credit cards. And then uh, started to work on, believe it or not, foreclosures, REO, and delinquencies and collections. Because it was my father and uncles, and they said the best place for you to start <laughs> is where all the crap and problems come up. Because then you'll know how to never make the loans the wrong way from the get go. So you look I like literally the muscle, started, huh? You look like the muscle. I was the muscle. I was there doing the evictions. <laughs> now, um, but in all seriousness, in, in pretty short order, I was, I was like a change agent, right? I was the one that would go into an area and say, "This is inefficient. This is back in the day. I'm, I'm 50." The word was re-engineering the organization. That's what it was in the 90s. And I was able to streamline things and figure out how to take technology and ultimately enable what some of the business processes and products needed to do. Because what's a bank? I mean, it's numbers. It's gigabytes. It's not a physical product like a nutrition bar or a drink. And one thing led to another. And... Um, I had the opportunity, I was very fortunate to go into a lot of areas, make them better. Um, so at a very early age, I was not only running technology, which when I first started in that area, there was 15, 20 people. By the time I left, there was 600 people in the information wow. technology group at the bank. That was just internal. And a lot of stuff was outsourced. And it's just one area led to another. So did you work at the bank? Obviously, when you were 13, you didn't go to summer camp that year. So you worked in the mailroom. Did you then work at the bank after college and yeah, wh after wh MBA school? Wh and when I graduated um, undergrad, Ohio State, go Buckeyes, I started full-time, but I swore I would never work for my dad and uncles. I was never going to go work for my family. Are you kidding me? So we started a home-building division where I could actually, um, I literally bought lots and help construct houses because we were a large um, single family um, lender for home builders across the country. Literally one of the largest land acquisition and development lenders in the country. And one thing led to another, but then when these other things started to happen with technology, I just couldn't help myself. I was like, this area is so inefficient. I had to make a decision. Did I want to be a builder or did I want to be a banker? And ultimately I chose banking mm -hmm. and um, it was an uh, amazing opportunity. So you worked there. So that's your not not that to was my I mean, entire not career. to diminish that you were the CEO, but that was your entire career was. Yeah. So so the question is, well, how the hell did I become the CEO? Yeah, from kinda. the So what happened was, I was proactive, and I was ultimately going into these areas and figuring out how to write a blueprint to make them better and more efficient, and. I ended up then knowing more about the area than almost anybody else because I was there trying to figure out what the next step was. At one point where it was my father and uncles, it was the three brothers, right? It, it, actually, to take one step back, it was my grandfather, mm -hmm. and he ended up acquiring the bank. The bank was um, founded in 1889, and it was a little savings loan in Cleveland, Ohio. He died when I was two, and my dad and uncles were only in their 20s. So they all became full-time at the bank when he passed away, and they divvied up the bank a third, a third, a third. So now all of a sudden, for decades, these three brothers, they worked well together. They divvied it up a third, a third, a third. I come into the picture, and I'm starting to take, okay, you know, information technology, I'll take that area. Or, oh, you know, lending. I'll... And before you knew it, before I was 30, I had 50% of the company reporting to me. Hmm. And one uncle said, Peter, we love you. You're doing amazing. You got to stop. You got more responsibility than any one of us three. I have a son. I have, you know, there's cousins. You know, there's a whole family here. We had 18 first cousins on that <laughs> side of the family. And lo and behold, um, I'm like, that's great, but why should I be held back if I have the potential to do more? So my uncle Bobby, the wise oldest of the three brothers, said, we're going to go hire an external person that does family business succession planning. He did This guy did Chick-fil-A family, the New York Times, all these big privately held companies. And he came and interviewed the board. He came and interviewed the senior management. Most of the family spent time with me and made a recommendation. And the brothers said, whatever the recommendation of this third party person, we're going to endure. We're not going to fight it. So what happened? The recommendation came out and I had nothing to do in regards to influence or bribery. 
But, and I'm going to be very humbled when I say this, he said this was something in his opinion that Peter had the potential of running the whole company. Dad and uncles, you should all step down. (laughs) Everybody should report to Peter, including family members. (laughs) He should become the sole CEO. So then some emotional intelligence (laughs) needs to kick in there. (laughs) Five minutes later, I'm on a plane to Paris learning leadership development (laughs) at Enciad because I was like, they're like, you better get your act together here, you 35-year-old. I was the youngest CEO of a top 50 bank by 20 years. Wow. Now, another day when we have more time, (laughs) that was also five minutes before the financial crisis started. Oh, God. So when you want to learn about emotional intelligence. Since 2008. This was in 2007, 2007, but, but the rumblings yeah, yeah. were really happening in 2000 in the banks. Ooh. So most of my years as the president and CEO, unfortunately, were firefighting and all the things you saw on the news, too big to fail. And with the head of the FDIC, the top senators and congressmen for TARP, the head of the investment bank, I was in those rooms with those people. Um, it was a crazy time. Why do you think that's for another day? <laughs> because that, that's a whole different, that's a whole movie, that's a movie. So you were the first CEO. Of the company, because presumably the you said the three brothers split. Equally. Oh, no, well, one of my, my the oldest uncle had the title CEO. Wise Bobby, yeah, Wise Bobby, Wise Bobby. Okay, yeah. So and I was, I think, this eighth CEO since like eighteen eighty nine. And who runs the company now? Unfortunately, the company was unable to stay private with our family in the crisis, so we weren't able to keep it. We still have the holding company. We'll call it the former bank holding company that's within our um, family after a lot of restructuring that worked out better than expected. Uh, but it was acquired by New York Community Bank uh, during the crisis. So unfortunately, easy come, easy go. <laughs> a couple billion dollars here, a couple billion dollars there, whatever. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. So then, and then you must have, it wasn't preordained then that you went from that to being a VC. No. So what I did is then I moved to California. Woohoo! At that time, I was 40. I wasn't married. I didn't have a family. <sighs> Contrary to what you might hear, Cleveland is not the singles dating mecca of the United States of America. A lot of publications and movies, they portray it. (laughs) It's not the case. So I said, let me check out California. I've never been. I literally bought a one-way ticket for uh, three months at a furnished apartment. And I said, I'll figure out my next move. Do I go to work for a big investment banking firm or a hedge fund or get back into banking? And after about three weeks here with Sunshine, I, I, I literally ended on Ocean Avenue. I said, if I'm going west, I'm not stopping three miles short. And, and I literally have been there now for 10 years. Actually, 10 years a week ago. And it's been amazing. And I enjoyed my life because I was working seven days a week for years and years and years, especially during the crisis. Traveled the world, got my yoga certification, went to improv comedy school. I, I was living it up in LA. I have seen Peter do a headstand of some sort. Wait, was it a headstand? Handstand. Headstand. I think I saw it too. On TV. Yeah. Oh, that would actually that was a one legged crow. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Actually, it was more of a one legged crow. And then he's (laughs) and then you stick your like at first it was like a bent knee and then it was it was it was a regular crow and then also an extending one leg. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. But no, in all seriousness, and then about five years into here, um, I needed to do more. I mean, I had a company with a lot of people. Um, I was involved with my family. A lot of the bank cleanup was uh, behind us. And I literally made my first investment. And what I found out in short order was these people, so it was actually a Seattle-based company, just from a family referral, they just were asking me all these questions about the company and govern all the organizational behavior-related things. And then I did a second, I did a third, I did a fifth, I did a tenth. And after I got about 15 or 20, um, I think my name started to get out in the city not that difficult when you're writing checks. Going, If you're writing oh, yeah, checks, they super find popular. you. Yeah, yeah. You, you become popular even if you're not that popular. And I needed a, I, at that point, I wanted to formalize my investing efforts and turn it into a, a VC firm. That's when I brought Elaine aboard. And uh, now we're about almost 50 companies in the portfolio. And that was about five years ago? The first investment was coming up to about five years ago. But the guts of it has happened in the last, call it, three, three and a half years. From your banking, becoming a VC, then do you shy away from, do you lean into anything fintech? Like, do you have opinions on what we should, what we should be looking at? What are the big trends you're looking at? There? Oh, it's, it's funny. Cause Elaine and I used to always joke about this. I get in my own way with all the fintech deals because I'm dangerous yeah. because I just know it better than 
some influencing deal or some CPG deal or some, you know, enterprise software deal. And I'm usually too picky and I've passed on a, a lot of really good fintech deals because I was just a knucklehead. So I'm trying this year to be fintech focused and let the, you know, reins off a little bit here and not be as tight on it. Uh, but I do love fintech. Uh, I love real estate. I think healthcare. Listen, at the end of the day, it's still the industries that are the multi-trillion dollar industries that still have a lot of room for inefficiencies and disruption. That's where I want to be. So so are there any kinds of investments that you won't do at, at your stage? Are there things that you stay away from? I would really say we're industry agnostic. Now, what we have done for the millions of people that are listening to this podcast across the globe yeah. that are interested in PLG, okay. in all seriousness, um, at PLG's website, we have a submission form. And anybody is welcome to submit um, their idea for funding, but we do it a little bit different. As you refer to, I'm on a TV show called Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch, which is sort of like a shark tank. So what we have done, and I actually think it's worked out pretty well, is in order for us to talk to a founder, regardless of what their topic is, without a referral, they have to also make a 60-second video to PLG Ventures to ultimately be considered for um, even investment. So we'll get the normal things. We'll get the pitch deck. We'll get what the valuation is, how they hear about us. They'll fill out the form, but then they have to make a 60-second video. And we give them instructions how to do that on YouTube. And that's how we make the determination. Because once again, it goes back to connection. I got to be a man of my word. Do you end up watching like a couple videos? 100% of them. And if somebody took the time to do a video, yeah. they will get a response from us 100% of the time. Does it also... Unless it's just ridiculous or something. Can like I that. also feed into... Can I also get on TV this way and get on your show? No, this is... this is like... You're like the biggest entrepreneur elevator pitch, right? Correct. Number one digital business show in the United Number States. Number one digital business show. Yeah. So it's big. So you don't... Do you have any ability to like get them on the show too? Yeah, so I, I do. I'm an executive producer of the show. So um, Entrepreneur's website has a submission form. Right now we're going to be filming season six coming up in the spring so they can go to entrepreneur.com elevator pitch and there's a whole submission form there uh, for the show but to put in perspective we have um with elevator pitch alone last season which was 12 episodes had, had 40 million views so i mean it really reaches so we, we have a lot of people that just see us almost as many as the podcast this almost week. as many as your podcast yes. so together yeah <laughs> we could probably have almost 100 million people um listening to this if we combine forces um or like 40 million i'm gonna go back to being serious for one second about fintech yeah what are the trends right now in fintech i think some of the big trends are still the enterprise SaaS software behind the scenes efficiency improvement stuff on almost all aspects of a bank's operations. They're still very inefficient. There's a lot of things that you see with the sexiness of the Robin Hoods and the Chimes, that front end. The consumer, yeah. But but most of those are not actually banks. They're just acquiring customers and they're doing things and there's a bank in real small print underneath the scene. It's being able to enable these banks to do what those other companies can do. That's why you saw Visa buy Plaid for $5 billion. I mean, what's going to happen is the big boys are not going to stay incompetent forever. And it's just going to be a matter of time that they're, it's all going to sort of converge. So then if that's the case, I would rather be behind the scenes where thousands of banks could leverage software. Uh, and that's where I have a lot of experience uh, running the operations of the company to know what types of technologies can make them more automated and efficient. So wait, Chime is not a bank? Chime, they call it a challenger bank. But if you were to actually look at it, uh, my I don't want to bet my life on it, that Chime itself is not an FDIC insured institution. Remind me again what a challenger bank is? It's sort of like a sort of bank, oh. right? It does the banking functions. Uh, but at the end of the day, think about how many of these credit card companies that are out doing co-branded credit cards, but they have these third-party companies that are really the credit card company that's part of Visa or MasterCard. So in a lot of these cases, you have to really understand, are they just a, a, a middleman type entity, but the real bank is behind the scene, but that bank doesn't have the capability to do stuff. So that's why these companies are able to be very successful. Yeah, so they provide the charter. They provide the actual charter. That, to me, is the bank. That's the FDIC insured account. But you think there's a big opportunity to be selling into the actual FDIC 
I believe for the thousands and thousands and thousands of banks and credit unions, and th there is so much opportunity there. Same thing for healthcare with the hospitals. These are the things that move very slow. Change doesn't happen at warp speed, but if you can provide a solution to them that ultimately can be transformative, those are sticky and they're worth a lot of money. Okay, so when you're evaluating whether it's fintech companies or otherwise, do you have certain questions you always ask? Anything unique about your diligence? I have a wild card. And the wild card is the Peter personal conviction level. <laughs> and if I don't have personal conviction, we just talked about it with mm -hmm. you know cannabis or it just doesn't excite me, I'm just not going to do it. Even if it's a great opportunity, um, I have enough companies in the portfolio. So that's how the decision may. So that's why it's intangible, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody can't prep to see if it's going to give me conviction or not. Do you have an example of it? Um, there was once or one company, two co-founders. I have to this day never been in a situation where how they communicated and conveyed things to me about what they were planning. It was almost like infectious, contagious. It was like like taking crack cocaine. Like I needed to hear more. Mm -hmm. Just talked. It was incredible. Okay. And the idea was just space age craziness. Not like literally space, but it was just like monetization we'll worry about 10 years from now it, it, it didn't check any of the boxes but i'm like if there's anybody that's going to be able to make this thing happen and figure it out it's these two got it and where do you want plg ventures to go will you be writing bigger checks we have a bigger team with you you know th the answer is it's got to be one or the other because if you're in the middle ground where it's a couple more people then i think it gets lost in the shuffle and I love what I'm doing. You know, the beautiful thing here is I get to keep 100% of the carry. So from that standpoint, a lot of what you just asked will depend on the success of this first batch. Mm. If the first batch performs really well and there's some, you know, very promising liquidity events, because reality is everybody asks me, well, how's the portfolio doing? I said, it's all worth zero. Mm. Until there's a liquidity event, I, I, tr I don't have to mark it up for anybody. I don't have any <laughs> reporting. So from that standpoint, until it hits my bank account, I have like the most expensive job, I think, in, could be in the United States because it's just outflowing of money, you know, millions and millions of dollars yeah. with basically nothing coming back in because there's no management fee either. So to me, a lot of that's going to depend upon how this initial batch does. Well, I hope you keep doing just what you're doing. Thanks so much for coming on our show today. It was my pleasure. It was really fun. 